Namaste everyone, welcome to my channel When Humanities is Life. In this video, we will discuss the chapter Arbitration, Tribunal Adjudication and Alternative Dispute Resolution. This is Unit 3 of your Class 12 Legal Studies textbook. The chapter begins with a comparison between the adversarial and the inquisitorial model. What happens in the adversarial model? There are two opposing parties and they are presenting their case before a neutral judge who is playing a passive role. They are employing lawyers to do it. The parties themselves, they develop their own theory of the case, they gather evidence to support their claims. Now these lawyers who are hired by the parties, they play a proactive role. They are very active. They debate the case in front of the judge. They gather evidence. They engage in cross-examination. In other words, they critically scrutinize the evidence as presented by the other party. Now the judge is neutral, the judge is passive and the judge is absolutely inactive and the judge decides the claims of both the parties solely on the basis of evidences, arguments and overall the merit of the cases as presented by the lawyer. The adversarial model is followed in common law countries. I hope you know the meaning of common law countries. Common law countries means here the judiciary actively participates in lawmaking through its decisions, orders and judgments. India, Australia, USA, UK, they are all common law countries. Next we come to the inquisitorial model. In the inquisitorial model, the judge decides the manner and mode in which the evidence must be presented. He evaluates the evidences and legal claims. And the judge is very active here. The judge takes a center stage, deciding claims by evaluating evidences and facts. So we see the judge is playing a very active role. This is called the interventionist model because the judge often intervenes in the process. He can manipulate things on the basis of his will. And this is also called the investigative model because the judge can investigate into the matter, can probe into the matter, much like the police. This model is followed in civil law countries. Civil law countries are those where the judiciary cannot make law, only the legislature and in some rare cases the executive too can make laws. Judiciary here can only resolve disputes between parties. In continental Europe and in countries where Roman law and Napoleonic code is followed like Germany and Russia, the inquisitorial model is followed. Next we come to the name of a book, Practical Guide to Evidence. This was written by Peter Murphy and he recounts an instructive evidence. In the adversarial system, it's sarcastically stating that since only the evidence matters, the lawyer often twists the facts of the case in such a manner that the truth itself is lost. Next, we come to the advantages and disadvantages of the adversarial model. The use of cross-examination has proved to be quite effective since the evidence is presented by one party, by the lawyer, is to be checked and cross-checked by the opposing lawyer. That's why no wrong evidence can be presented. Only authentic and credible evidences are to be presented by the lawyers before the neutral judge. And since here the parties are more involved in hiring lawyers, they create their own theories of the case with the lawyers, that's why they are more willing to accept the result. But there are several disadvantages of the adversarial model. The cost of justice system falls upon the parties and this creates an inbuilt discrimination. Parties with better resources, they hire competent lawyers and they present sophisticated evidences. These two words must be present in your answers. Okay. Next, accessibility and affordability are important challenges of the adversarial model. The role of lawyers are very high. The lawyers are taking um, a lot of fees from the parties that's why their role also becomes important what they will do before the judge depends upon their fees their roles are also very important the way they argue the case matters procedural formalities also prolong the procedure we can often hear about cases that starts um, with one generation and can last up till the next generation when the next generation becomes old a particular case is still running in other words cases here can last for years. That's a disadvantage of the adversarial model. Third point is that the judge plays a less active role and they need not ascertain the truth. They will be neutral and whatever the lawyers say on the basis of that, they will decide the case. It doesn't matter whether that's in favor of justice or not. Justice here often doesn't matter. 
how the lawyers present their case and what they can understand from their debates and discussions that matters more in the adversarial model on the other hand let's come to the advantages of the inquisitorial model the system offers procedural efficiency because of the active role of judges it, pre it prevents prolonged trial so judges can actively in, uh, participate in the process they can manipulate the case and they can make sure that the case doesn't last long they can resolve the case much earlier they are not duty bound to be neutral they are not duty bound to be inactive and it also preserves equality the party with more resources and able lawyers may not be able to influence the judge you know as individuals as good citizens all of us want to do our duties towards our country so that our country can evolve it can do better so the judges here with good intention they can actively ensure that they preserve equality between parties and their role prevents any delay in dispensation of justice but there are two disadvantages also in that inquisitorial model here there are some alleged um misbehaviors by the judges the judges often steps into the shoes of the investigator okay if it's a if it's only a judge then it can be steps and if it judges then it will be step that's a grammatical error if i say it like that so as the judge steps into the shoes of the investigator he can no longer be neutral now the judge can be inclined towards one party whom they think are correct are right and they need justice that's why the judge steps into the shoes of the legislature uh, not the legislature by to the invest investigator the shoes of the investigator i'm sorry and there are, there may be a lack of incentive structure for the judges to to involve themselves in a case now we come to the main part of this chapter part b adr the definition of adr written in black ink is important adr system refers to the use of non adversarial techniques of adjudication of legal disputes non adversarial all right something that is less formal and not that much formal like in an adversarial system adversarial means the word adversarial is okay, adversarial comes from the word adversary which means something that is characterized by adversity opposition what happens in an adversarial system it's formal dispute between two opposing parties who are in a conflict it's very formal but adr is a lot less formal even before the advent of formal court culture india had several adrs right from the vedic age we had kula shreni and puga kula is for settling disputes of family community tribe race and caste so it, it's f c t r c shreni is for internal disputes in business and for corporation of artisans you just remember that shreni and puga both are for the commerce branches shreni is in business and for artisans also puga is for association of traders and the commerce branches panchayat too is a best example of present day adr prevalent in the villages of india in these institutions interest based negotiations are dominated by a neutral third party interest based negotiations means two parties who are presenting their cases who are trying to ad advance and promote their interest in front of a neutral third party which means a judge seeking to identify the needs and concerns of both the parties so once we describe these three things you should also write this extra line as your conclusion that will you know, benefit you um before the teacher you will get more marks if you are so fluent in whatever you write benefits of adr they are speedier informal and cheaper three keywords then they provide a more convenient forum for the parties often we see parties can choose the place time and procedure for conducting the preferred dispute redressal process disputes in technical cases now adr is so flexible that they can also refer the case to a to a non legal expert someone without a legal background like an engineer can also be a arbitrator can also be a neutral third party or a judge in the adr platforms suppose disputes pertaining to the re uh, re regulation of the construction industries they can be referred to a engineer because the lawyer won't understand the details of the construction industry while an engineer will now adr also reduces the 
you know, high pendency of the courts and the delays in the court proceedings. Since we are so many people living in the same country, we have so many disputes, in comparison to that, the number of courts are, are less, the number of judges are less. So we need such platforms like the ADR, arbitration, Lok Adalat, Ombudsman and all these things we will discuss now to settle our disputes more efficiently. Next we come to the problems faced by the traditional law courts in India. First and foremost, the lack of number of courts and judges which creates an inadequacy in the matter. I was discussing this right now, there is nothing to explain here. Increasing litigation, litigation means formally settling or adjudicating a case in court which means number of cases is increasing in India because of the high population, population is increasing, complexity of law and some continuation of some old laws which are not, not even there, not even relevant but still making it more confusing for all of us, increasing cost of litigation, now, this is nothing new, the cost is also high in prosecuting and defending a case, lawyers take their own money, we have to pay money for registering a case and other incidental expenses are also high. Delay in disposal of cases resulting in huge pendency in courts. So, we know that a case can last for several years. That's what it means by delay in disposal of cases. So, ADR and all its methods are far more successful alternatives to the formalistic culture of settling disputes. Now, we come to the first major type of ADR, arbitration. Now, ADR refers to a species of you know, uh, dispute resolution and arbitration is the first instance of ADR. Arbitration is a private arrangement. It's a very private arrangement of settling disputes in a less adversarial, less formal and more flexible forum. We know adversarial, adversarial, when something is adversarial, it's characterized by adversity and opposition and it's far more formal. But in case of arbitration, it's less formal, less adversarial and more flexible. So it's AFF. We should remember arbitration as AFF. Less adversarial, less formal, more flexible. I hope that helps. And abiding by the judgment of a selected third party instead of taking it out to the established courts of justice. Arbitration, it can begin in two ways. Either by an arbitration agreement. What happens here? There are two parties in a dispute and they agree to take their case to arbitration instead of carrying it out to the traditional courts of justice, to traditional courts. We are settling our disputes in arbitration. That's more efficient and more convenient for us. Or through court referral. What happens here? After a case is formally started before a court, one of the parties may write to the judge to refer the case to arbitration. If the court wants, then the court will refer the case to, to the arbitration platforms and that's called court referral. The court is referring. There are some important terms here like arbitrator. Arbitrator means the qualified expert. The process of arbitration is confidential or secretive. Secrets revealed in the arbitration process are not necessarily revealed before the public. You know, this is, this is another benefit. In case of a court proceeding, it's often open to the public. Media can cover a case if it's important. But in case of arbitration, it's very secretive and confidential. Perfect for commercial disputes where business secrets should not be revealed. That's the main motive of the parties. And the decision rendered by the arbitrator, which is called the arbitral award, it's binding on the parties, which means the parties has to accept them. They have to act in accordance to what the arbitrator says. That's it. Next we come to uh, yeah, arbitral award, it holds several similarities with the court order or judgment. We know that it's binding, we're discussing it right now and the arbitrator can grant interim reliefs like um, no, interim measures like temporary relief. Someone who is suffering, someone who is arrested can be, um, can be you know, released from the jail if the arbitrator wants. These are interim measures which can be given, these are temporary measures they mean much like what the court can give. The court can give us bail. Similarly, arbitrator too can take such steps. And there are some dissimilarities also. We know in general, at least in common law countries like India, the judges who are delivering a judgment, they have to refer to similar cases which has been decided much earlier. They have to follow judicial precedents. But that's not the case in arbitral awards. They do not have precedential value. 
suppose let's consider in our court in our formal courts like supreme court or high court whenever a problem whenever a case is settled the final judgment of the judge remains as an important law for the future judges these are called legal precedents or judicial precedents and they are very powerful for future judges whenever a similar case is being fought this particular case this particular judgment will be followed later but in case of the arbitral award they do not have precedential value suppose today in a arbitration platform there is a case being settled the judgment given by the arbitrator the arbitral award they won't serve as law for the future judges that's a dissimilarity with the formal courts arbitrators are free to base their judgments on their own conception of what's right and what's wrong uh, this page is little blurry i'm sorry for that but i hope if i zoom in it won't be a problem types of arbitration the first type of arbitration is domestic arbitration arbitration within india arbitration with indian parties and the rules applicable here the laws applicable here are all indian that's a domestic arbitration where everything is from within the country for an arbitration here proceedings are conducted in a place outside india suppose somewhere in switzerland the process is being conducted but the arbitral award the judgment the force of the judgment is to be enforced in the country that's for an arbitration ad hoc arbitration it's governed by parties themselves is a very interesting type of arbitration where parties themselves can choose the arbitrator they can uh, decide things without taking recourse to formal arbitral institutions in india we have institutions of arbitration where they can give us a uh, able arbitrator they can uh, tell us what we need to do in the entire process like for instance in the next type of arbitration institutional arbitration but in the case of ad hoc arbitration the parties are all in all they govern the process okay next we come to institutional arbitration here parties can select a particular institution as we said this particular institution takes the arbitration forward they select an arbitrator neutral third party they lay, lay down the rules applicable the mode of obtaining evidences and there are several institutions to govern arbitration like for instance in india we have london chamber of international arbitration lcia it is offices across the world including in new delhi in india and we will slowly study about the ancestral model law united nations you know uh, convention on international trade law that will also govern that will also you know dictate the world about rules and arbitration india also joined in 1996 to this convention fifth type of arbitration is statutory arbitration an arbitration which is imposed on the parties because of a particular law a particular statute statute and law is the same thing are the same things so defense of india act for instance in 1971 it mandates a recourse to arbitration in case of any disputes arising from within the statute of this 1971 act that's statutory arbitration last but not the least international commercial arbitration is a sixth type of arbitration here at least one party is a resident or body corporate of a country other than india arbitration with a government of a foreign country is considered international commercial arbitration so at least one of the parties is a resident or a corporate body of another country suppose a body of usa and another party of india are in disputes that's called an international commercial arbitration this is mostly in the sphere of commerce trade etc and this type of arbitration is specifically defined under section 2 part 1 part f of arbitration and conciliation act of 1996 don't worry you will study a lot about this act right now and it's a very important law let me tell you next laws and arbitration as i said first of all just mark these two things very important arbitration and conciliation act 1996 which is modeled on ancestral model law and this model law is as i was just discussing right now united nations commission on international trade law ancestral model law on international commercial arbitration 1985 just say this thing three four times i know you will be able to remember after its creation 
the United Nations General Assembly recommended that all the countries must give consideration to this ancestral model law of 1985 to bring uniformity in the process of international arbitration to make this process consistent and uniform the united nations which we know is an international organization the most authoritative and important international organ in the world right now is the un it wanted international arbitration to be uniform and consistent that's why this 1985 uh, you know uh, model law was enacted the supreme court in india has said that arbitration and conciliation of act of 1996 the first one here it has to be interpreted by keeping in mind the commercial sense of dispute mostly it's applicable in commercial disputes in trade related issues that's why we need to remember this and this was established properly in konkan railways corporation limited versus mehul construction company it's a very important case this page let me tell you guys is very important you do take a screenshot if the screen is blurry you make sure that you are being able to see it by increasing the resolution of the video from settings don't miss this page it's a main thing key to the success that you will have in this chapter and then we come to the next platform of arbit of you know adr which is administrative tribunals another form of adr the 42nd amendment act amendment means a change which is brought to the constitution of india this was made in 1976 and this particular amendment added articles 323a and 323b to the constitution these articles empower the parliament to set up tribunals for adjudication of specialized disputes okay the range of disputes mentioned in the constitution refers to disputes about service conditions of government employees whenever we are discussing about administrative tribunals we are referring to government service disputes no doubt and collection and enforcement of tax industrial labor and disputes matters about land reforms election disputes ceiling on urban property productions procurement and supply of food or essential goods these are the things that falls within the purview of administrative tribunal the 42nd amendment act of 1976 which added articles 323a and 323b it ushered the era of tribunalization of the indian judiciary theek hai finally we come to the act here in the same year when the ancestral model law was passed for arbitration the administrative tribunals act was also passed in india for setting up the cat and the sats cat means central administrative tribunal i hope it's visible and the state administrative tribunals the central administrative tribunal settles disputes of the central government employees about their service conditions and various things and the state administrative tribunals it settles disputes of people working in the state governments basically they are the same things the only the level differs one at the center another at the states now see appeals against the orders of administrative tribunals can lie before the division bench of the concerned high court what this means is that uh, definitely we can say that sometimes these adr platforms beat arbitration or beat the administrative tribunals they definitely give judgments which are not acceptable to a particular party and they can challenge the disputes of the uh administrative tribunals in that case the decision can only be overruled by a division bench of a high court division bench means where there is more than one judge and when there are almost 13 judges then it's a constitution bench it only happens in the supreme court the benefits of tribunals there are several benefits they make the process flexible increases efficiency they are speedy and inexpensive they supplement the role of courts and reduce pendency which means delay in disposal of cases in courts in the l chandra kumar case in 1997 the supreme court said that the tribunals these cats sat and other things they won't take away the exclusive jurisdiction of the courts which means that they won't replace our courts it can't happen that these adr platforms will completely uh, you know uh, what is it called replace the courts it won't happen the courts are equally important more important rather adr 
platforms are simply a means of settling disputes in a more speedy and informal way so that we don't have to go to the courts and in case there is a dispute between the two decisions if we had to overrule a decision of a um, of you know, the ADR platforms we can approach the high court division bench of high courts can do it next we come to two other forms of ADR one is mediation and other is conciliation now let us let us come to mediation what's the definition what's the difference between mediation and arbitration in case of mediation the method of ADR in which the disputing parties appoint a neutral third party who facilitates the mediation process in order to assist the parties to reach an acceptable and voluntary agreement dekhi what happens here here the mediator mediator is a third party the mediator merely facilitates the process the mediator cannot give a binding judgment the mediator is simply a guardian of the process they can assist the parties to reach an amicably settled you know thing a settled decision but the mediator is not holding any coercive power they can't ascertain what they think is they can definitely give an advice but the there is no such power given in the hands of the mediator that simply a, he or she is simply a neutral third party it's far more flexible and informal it's inexpensive fast and confidential see negotiation is way less formal mediation is little more formal than negotiation and arbitration is more formal than mediation and even more formal than arbitration are the court proceedings which are really formal this will help you to understand the connection now outcome of mediation does not have a similar binding attribute like arbitral award okay so that's also a very fair point of difference in case of arbitration the judgment rendered by the judge by the arbitrator rather is binding upon the parties that's why uh, it's important for the parties to accept them to enforce them but in case of mediation there is no such binding attribute in the outcome of the mediation process types of mediation mediation are also several types evaluative mediation it's focused on providing an evaluation of the case directing the parties towards a settlement evaluative mediator also has an advisory role and evaluative mediator will evaluate the case will say what's right or wrong but simply can advise the parties now the parties have to act according to either the advice or whatever they think is right when parties agree the evaluative mediator will express what's right what's fair and reasonable facilitative mediation here the mediator simply facilitates the conversation which means if there is a dispute between two parties the parties can't talk and settle their matters they will come to a facilitative mediator and the person will simply enhance and advance their conversation it's focused on helping the parties find a resolution to the dispute it further provides a structure and agenda for discussions transformative mediation is focused on supporting empowerment and recognition empowerment is the ability to deliberate and make a decision in conflict interaction all right these two things are not there in your, in your textbook the definitions of these two things so please make a note of it don't miss it it will not clarify things empowerment means ability to deliberate and you know, basically to talk when there are two parties who are fighting amongst themselves definitely it's not possible for them it's a dif- little difficult for them to amicably settle a dispute to talk even to talk that's the thing that the transformative mediator will do that's called empowerment make a decision by talking by allowing them to communicate amongst themselves and recognition means listening to the other party understanding the other person's perspective also you can see a principle of legal justice here which is ordi alter impartum listen to the other side if you remember from chapter 1 now this is done by allowing and encouraging deliberation decision making and perspective taking micro focus is on communication It's only this part is given in your textbook you do make a note of these two definitions of empowerment and recognition shifts mediation with arbitration sometimes when mediation is coupled with arbitration the so arbitration may the arbitral award is binding that's why it's pretty much effective when coupled with mediation 
It's more appropriate in civil matters and it resembles criminal plea bargaining and Confucian judicial procedure. But it can you know, create significant ethical problems for the mediator. Mediators has a unique role as someone with no coercive power. We know they cannot assert what's right. They can simply advise or they can simply express their opinion. What they say is not binding. There is no such binding award that they can give. So if this position changes later, parties may be hostile. Last but not the least, online mediation. It's pretty much self-explanatory. It employs online technology since there are some uh, parties who are old or sick or because of some you know, geographical barriers, they cannot attend a place. That's when online mediation can be used by suppose platforms like Zoom or Google Meet to settle disputes. These are all the several five types of mediation. Process of mediation, here the neutral third party facilitates the process. They don't follow a uniform set of rules. That's a you know, point of similarity between um, any kind of ADR, arbitration or um, administrative tribunals or mediation. They do not follow a uniform set of rules and whatever their decisions are, they won't serve as precedents for future judges. Mediation can be triggered in three ways. Pre-litigation mediation, that's a pre-agreed mediation. Parties can resolve their claims by this process by agreeing to resolve the disputes without initiating formal judicial proceedings. Before going to court, they can, so, uh, they can re take recourse to mediation. Court referrals, parties may agree to mediate at the beginning of formal court proceedings. That's also a thing. And appellate stage mediation, mediation taken after formal court proceedings have started. Even after parties have moved to a court, if they want, they can come back to mediation. Now, types of suitable, suitable uh, types of disputes suitable for mediation, contractual disputes, which means contracts, money claims, it's suited disputes which need a continuity of relationship, neighbors, easement rights, they need to continue the relationship. Such disputes can also be settled through mediation. Consumer disputes, more suited. Consumer means, you know, whenever we take service from a company or suppose we are buying something. Disputes arising from strained relations, matrimonial and partnership, these are also settled for, um, settled by mediation. And there are certain cases, on the other hand, which are absolutely out of the scope of mediation, like representative suit, representative suits as in um, what, what we call PILs. In PILs, what happens, there is a weaker party and th there are other well-off parties like us. We can help them to come up to our levels by taking their case uh, to, a, to the court by writing letters to the Supreme Court or High Court judges, they can then transform our letters to, you know, binding petitions and we can help poorer parties. Those are called extra constitutional or representative suits. Election disputes can also be settled. Criminal offenses, Achha, I'm sorry, representative suits, election disputes, criminal offenses and Cases against people like minors or the ones who are mentally challenged, they cannot be settled by mediation. These cases are outside the scope of mediation. And this was explicitly established in Afcon's Infrastructure Limited versus Shirian Varki Construction. So this is the second case that you are, third case in fact, that you are studying this chapter. Do make a note of these cases and important laws. I will also revise this once I complete the syllabus because it's difficult, you know, sometimes to remember so many things. Next, conciliation. It's another method of ADR. Parties out of their own free will appoint a neutral third party to resolve their disputes. But the only difference between mediation and conciliation is that a mediator cannot dictate the parties to do something the decision of the mediator is not binding. At the same time, a conciliator can be an interventionist. He or she can suggest potential reforms. So a conciliation can conciliator can be more assertive, can be more, you know, uh, binding on the parties. Laws on mediation and conciliation. Here we have section 89 of CPC 1908. This was established by the 2002 amendment. It governs both mediation and conciliation, section 89 of CPC, the method, procedural and legal practice of civil disputes. It deals with 
only court referred mediation however pre litigation mediation doesn't have any law as yet conciliation they can only find a reference in section 89 of cpc and the process and methods are described in the first act that we have learned arbitration and conciliation act of 1996 plus apart from section 89 of cpc apart from arbitration and conciliation act we also have industrial disputes act of 1947 it provides for conciliation as a viable means for resolving disputes in the labor sector remember these three things okay next lok adalat which means people's court it's yet another method of adr alternative dispute resolution the concept of lok adalat it comes from the idea of nyay panchayat since we have many cases that are pending we need to settle these and it's possible for our courts to do it that's why platforms like lok adalat they settle our disputes which are pending disputes that are pending are settled by the lok adalat they don't take any money for that that's the main benefit of lok adalat modern lok adalat is presided over by a sitting or retired judicial officer so this is an important thing guys the constituents the constituent members of a lok adalat a sitting or retired judicial officer is a chairman there is a lawyer and a social worker the jurisdiction the lok adalat can settle any matter pending before a court matters at the pre litigative stage which is not formally instituted by a court and types of cases include civil and family disputes so domestic cases can be settled labor disputes disputes in the industry compoundable criminal offenses these can be settled bank recovery cases can be settled public service disputes through telephone electricity they can be settled motor accident claims all these types of issues can be settled through lok adalat and definitely these should be pending or at the pre litigative stage benefits of lok adalat as i said they cannot take money from us no court fee is chargeable and if we have already paid some fee before to the court then these can be refunded no strict application of procedural laws the disputing parties can directly interact with judges you know that's the thing in all these ADR methods. We can directly talk to the judge. That's the best thing here. It's so flexible and informal. And decision is also binding on the parties. Whenever a decision is binding, it's more effective. That's why mediation is a little less effective. It's merely good for discussions only. But since it's not binding, it's not effective. All other types of ADR are effective since most of them are binding. Salient features of lok adalat. This is not that much, but yeah, you should read it. It's there in NCERT. Participation, accommodation, fairness, voluntariness, neighborliness, transparency, lack of animosity. I couldn't come up with a mnemonic here, but if you can, do comment down below. Laws on lok adalat, pursuant to Article Thirty Nine A of the Constitution. Now, this Article Thirty Nine A is an important part of your legal service chapter, which you will do in term two. So. keep it in your mind okay article 39 a of the constitution states that justice has to be done to all those persons who are seeking justice and that's why the legal services authorities act of 1987 which was established by this 39 amendment act at least it has a reference to it this established permanent lok adalats all right constitutes legal services authorities to provide le- uh, legal aid to the poor and competent legal services to the weaker sections in 2002 the act legal services authorities act was amended to establish permanent lok adalats the 2002 amendment was mostly about settling disputes in the public utility services but not important in this chapter we will do this in the second last chapter now nalsa national legal services authority a body a statutory body means a body that is established by a particular statute or law nalsa was established by the legal services authorities act nalsa yes it's responsible for laying down policies and principles for making legal services under the act and frame the most effective and economical schemes for legal services nalsa is engaged in providing legal services legal aid and speedy justice through lok adalats it disburses funds and grants for implementing legal aid similarly the state legal services authorities district legal services authorities are also there in every state capital and in every district
next we come to ombudsman we were almost completed so please be a patient right now ombudsman it comes from the indigenous swedish danish norwegian term ombudsmada which means representative it settles disputes and it investigates complaints and attempts to resolve them usually through recommendation and mediation it also aims at identifying systematic issues leading to poor service and breaches of people's right ombudsman you just know the preview of this ombudsman settles disputes in the banking and insurance sector and we also have similar ombudsman which also is called lokpal and lokayukta at the central and state levels these resolves cases of corruption these investigates into corruption by ministers and public servants so ombudsman is an interesting branch of adr it deals with the public as well as public sector it typically gives financial compensation to the aggrieved party the government has designated several ombudsmen called cvo chief vigilance officer to address grievances in banking and insurance it's an important part so you have to read the ncrt okay and for instance the chief vigilance commission is was set up on the recommendation of the santanam committee from 1962 to 64 this committee was appointed and cvc chief vigilance commission established by the indian government it is a apex vigilance institution it's an institution it's an institution which uh which is free of control from any executive authority it monitors all vigilance activity and it advises various authorities in central government in planning executing reviewing and reforming vigilance work what is the advantage of ombudsman it examines complaints from outside the pending state institution and avoids conflicts inherent in self policing so since in the state from the state machinery if there is someone who is investigating into a particular case there can be a loophole because they will ignore issues from within the government that's on the case in ombudsman they are very flexible yet very particular about settling disputes and looking into grievances of people even if it's done by people in the government and there are some disadvantages like it's highly dependent upon um the condition where appropriate individuals has to be chosen and at least some effective officials of the, of the state should cooperate lokpal and lokayukta lokpal caretaker of people it's an ombudsman at the central level in india and lokayukta is a similar anti corruption ombudsman organization in the indian states lokpal and lokayukta act this is this is an act important in case of this anti corruption ombudsman lokpal and lokayukta it was enacted in 2013 it's a very important act do memorize this you have to remember all the acts and the cases also okay we have five cases in this chapter from arbitration mediation conciliation administrative tribunals and definitely lokpal lokayukta you have to remember these acts and cases now the act applies to public servants in and outside india it includes within its purview ex prime ministers and even the current prime ministers except you have to remember the exceptions except for matters about international relations external and internal security public order atomic energy and peace it also brings within its purview any person who has been a minister of the union member of either of the houses of the parliament and it shall not inquire into any matter so this is the examination of not examination it, this is an exception in this uh, of this point 3 it won't inquire into any matter with respect to anything said or matters covered in clause 2 of article 105 this part is difficult to remember so you, you if you if even if you you know uh, uh, simply uh, avoid writing this part you should simply write these three points anything said matters covered in article 105 105 or vote given by a member of the parliament this is the exception of part 3.3 here and finally it includes groups a b c d officials equivalent from amongst the public servants we have we know about the ias officers iips and ifs officers and various other officers these public servants who come under the purview of prevention of corruption act 1988 who have who are serving or who have served all these individuals are the ones to whom the lokpal and lokayukta act 2013 is applicable and their aim is to combat acts of corruption 
and bribery of civil servants mainly. Working of Lokpal At least two-thirds of the members of Lokpal must approve of an inquiry. Any such inquiry which is held in camera or which is recorded, which is written down, they can be dismissed. They won't be made available to people or not published if it decides so, if it infringes upon the you know, prestige of a particular a respected person, maybe a minister. It provides for the manner in which public servants must declare their assets. It's an important thing of this act. And the powers of Lokpal are extensive, almost equivalent to the superintendent's inquiry and investigative powers of the CVC, Chief Vigilance Commission and the police. Then it must consist of an inquiry in prosecution wing. Lokpal can even recommend the government to create courts to decide cases arising from the Prevention of Corruption Act 1988. And in some states, they have the institution of Lok Ayukta also. You should, should remember the basic thing that Lokpal is in case of the central government. I have already discussed this, but still, and Lok Ayukta is for the states. Don't write Lokpal for the states, okay? I once wrote that when I was in class 12. Anyway, so some states had the institutions of Lok Ayukta. Before the enactment of the, of the 2013 Act, like for instance, Delhi, Kerala, Karnataka, Maharashtra, all of them, they had Lokayukta even before 2013. That's a good thing. Maharashtra was the first state to introduce the institution of Lokpal, Lokayukta, I'm sorry, so sorry, once again, in 1971. And the composition of Lokpal, once again important, Lokpal consists of a chairperson who has been a Chief Justice of India, or a judge of the Supreme Court or an eminent judicial member who is very able, you know, and having knowledge and expertise of not less than 25 years in anti-corruption policy and public administration. Such a person can also be the chairperson, either a chief justice of India or a judge of Supreme Court or a judicial member or a jurist with knowledge in these two areas. Total number of members of Lokpal should not exceed eight. So half of the body must be judicial members, must be legal members. Okay? And there is a box at the end of this chapter. It's in page 104, which states that 19 Indian states of Lokayukta. Maharashtra was the first one to establish Lokayukta in 1971. And there are some states like West Bengal, like Tamil Nadu, Tripura, Nagaland, Sikkim, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Jammu and Kashmir, and also Arunachal Pradesh. They don't have Lokayukta even till now. So that's pretty much it about this chapter. I hope I could help you in some way in this chapter. If so, don't forget to like my video and I will definitely make the uh, PDF of notes available. And I will also say one thing, please see the videos because I know you all are interested in notes, but definitely I need you to see the videos because you know that's important for me also. So thank you so much. Stay tuned with my channel for more such videos and definitely if you have some recommendation about something that you want to say, any doubt, feel free to comment. Thank you so much. Best of luck for all your exams this year and also for CUED exam if you have to give it. So bye.